Um, before, we, um, before we start to read, uh, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks uh, for giving us your word, uh, for giving us um, tough passages and tough words um, that we need to deal with as your followers. And Father, I pray that uh, today that uh, your people, uh, and the people who hear your word, uh, will understand what you are saying to them. Uh, Heavenly Father, may um, my words not be a hindrance, um, but my, my words be a great help uh, in the transmission of your great word um, to your people here. Amen. Uh, so on the uh, service sheet, uh, there's a sermon outline, but the passage that we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 37 is, is printed on there. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven me, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Well, last week I hope you'll remember that we saw Jesus as the one fulfilling prophecy as being a quiet healer, not calling out in the street, not breaking a reed or snuffing out a wick. And at first reading of today's passage, you might think, whoa, what was Bernard talking about last week? What happened to gentle Jesus, meek and mild? If you are not with me, you are against me. Brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? But before you worry about contradictions or inconsistency, it's worth thinking about how our words can build up and how our words can tear down. Jesus is very angry with the evil words that these men have spoken. The ultimate conflict behind all other conflicts is the conflict between Jesus and Satan. This conflict was prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15. And it continues all the way into the book of Revelation. The reason we experience conflict 
particularly when we're living for God and following Jesus, is because of this ultimate conflict between Jesus and Satan. And the words that we speak, how we use our tongue, can be a very good guide to which side we are on. And we see this in the conflict that arises between Jesus and the Pharisees in today's passage. The Pharisees know that Jesus has superhuman power to do the things that he does. There is no other explanation. And yet they refuse to acknowledge that his power comes from the Holy Spirit. And that leaves them with only one alternative. And when they accuse Jesus of being empowered by Satan instead of the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells them that they have committed the unforgivable sin. Knowing that will help us to see why Jesus is so angry by their evil words coming out of their evil hearts. I'm at point one in the outline. The story begins with the healing of a demon-possessed man who, as well as having a demon, he was blind and mute. And this accusation that Jesus is empowered by Satan. But notice that it's not the people in general who are listening who accuse Jesus in this way. It is only the leadership represented here by the Pharisees. The people have a very different reaction. The people are astonished at Jesus, at his miracles and at his speech. And they wonder if Jesus is the Messiah. Look at verses 22 and 23. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. All the crowds were astounded and said, could this be the Son of God? Sorry, could this be the Son of David is what they actually said. The Son of David was a common term for the Messiah who would come. The Old Testament prophets foretold that the Messiah would be in the line of David. And so Son of David came to be a common way to refer to the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, the prophets had foretold that he would work miracles including healing the blind and the mute. And so when Jesus works this particular miracle, the people naturally wonder, could this be the son of David? Could this man be the Messiah that we have been waiting for? Well, as I've already said, the Pharisees have a completely different reaction to Jesus' miracle. Instead of wondering if Jesus could be the Messiah, which with their knowledge of the Old Testament, they should have, they dive off the deep end and attribute Jesus' power to Satan. Look at verse 24. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Can you imagine? Now, the word Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies, um, quite literally. It was another name for Satan in Jesus' time, and so they were literally accusing Jesus of driving out demons with the power of Satan the prince of demons. What are they trying to do here? Well, they are seeking to discredit Jesus. They obviously can't deny his ability to cast out demons and to heal because everyone around can see it. But they can cast doubt on the source of his power. The bottom line is they don't believe that Jesus is from God and yet he clearly has some supernatural powers And so instead they accuse him of driving out the demons by the prince of demons, Satan himself. But the reality, and at point two in the outline, is that Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus confronts the Pharisees with reality. And he does this in two ways. First, he shows the Pharisees that their accusation is ridiculous. It makes no sense. Now look at verses 25 and 26. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? How or why would Satan want to drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if Satan is divided against himself, then his kingdom cannot stand. If Jesus is casting out demons by the power of the prince of demons, then Satan is fighting against his own people. 
his own followers. But that does not make any sense. It's like a group of soldiers firing on each other instead of on the enemy. Well, let's say you're in the NRL grand final and you're running for the winning try in the final seconds. You've got a clear field ahead of you when suddenly one of your own teammates chases you down and tackles you and you lose. Well, none of that makes any sense. And that's what Jesus is telling the Pharisees here. What you are saying does not make sense. It is illogical. And then Jesus presses his point even further and he makes it very personal. Look at verse 27. If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason they will be your judges. Now there were other people who drove out demons in Jesus' day and apparently some of them were associated with the Pharisees. Not necessarily their own sons, but ones that they had taught and mentored. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, if it's Satan who drives out Satan, then how do your people drive him out? In other words, they weren't just accusing Jesus with this statement, they were in fact accusing themselves and their followers. So Jesus says, your own people will be your judges. Jesus confronts the Pharisees with reality, first of all by showing them that their accusation makes no sense. And if Satan drives out Satan, then how do your people do it? But the reality is that Jesus is driving out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, not Satan. And this is a sign that God's kingdom has arrived in Jesus And verses 28 and 29, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. In other words, it's not Satan's kingdom attacking Satan, it's God's kingdom attacking Satan. And that makes a whole lot more sense. The kingdom of God has arrived in the person of Jesus and the proof is in the miracles that he performs. Just as the prophets had foretold hundreds of years earlier, Jesus is driving out demons by the Spirit of God. Jesus is demonstrating his power over Satan and Satan's kingdom. And Jesus says that no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Well, imagine a strong man, armed to the teeth. This guy's built, he's huge, he works out. Not only that, he's got an automatic rifle in his hands. He's not afraid to use it. I'm not sure if it's Schwarzenegger or Stallone, but you get the picture. If you're going to rob this bloke, you can't just walk in and start taking things out of his house while he stands by and watches. No, you're going to have to overpower him and tie him up first. And you're going to have to tie him up pretty well. Then you can rob his house and he can't do anything about it. But if you're going to bind the strong man, you had better make sure that you are stronger than him first. And in these verses, Satan is the strong man. Make no mistake, Satan is a powerful and malevolent being. You cannot just walk into his house, into his kingdom and start plundering it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus could not be robbing Satan's house by casting out demons unless he had already overpowered and tied up Satan. In other words, Jesus is not controlled or possessed by Satan. Satan is overpowered and controlled by Jesus. Yes, Satan is strong, but Jesus is much stronger. Jesus has shown the Pharisees that their accusation makes no sense. Jesus driving out demons by the Spirit of God is not a sign of Satan's kingdom. It is a sign that God's kingdom has come upon them in Jesus. Next, uh, point three on the outline, Jesus speaks a word of judgment against the Pharisees. And he begins by saying that there is no middle ground. You are either with Jesus or you are against him. Uh, Look at verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. You cannot be neutral about Jesus. 
If you are not with Jesus, Jesus says, you are against him. If you are not gathering with him, that is if you are not doing the things that he wants you to do, then you are scattering. You are working against him. You cannot avoid a decision about Jesus. To be neutral, to not decide, is to still make a decision. When it comes to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, there is no middle ground. And then Jesus shares some good news and some bad news. The good news is that all kinds of sins and blasphemies can be forgiven. Praise the Lord. The bad news is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Look at verses 31 and 32. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the one to come. The good news is that all kinds of sins and blasphemies can be forgiven. And that is really good news. It means that no matter how badly you think you have sinned against God, God can still forgive you. Think of what the Apostle Paul was like before Jesus confronted him on the Damascus Road. The Bible says that even blasphemy against Jesus can be forgiven. That is really good news. But the bad news, Jesus also said, the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Critical to this passage, then, is the meaning of blasphemy. The word refers to speaking wickedly or slanderously against God and his nature. And it's not a minor offence, it is a major one. Sometimes people use blaspheme to refer to people using a holy name in anger. And that's an application of the idea, but it's not what's intended here. In this passage, consciously arguing that the miracles of Jesus were done by the power of Satan is the primary meaning of blasphemy. To blaspheme the Son of Man would be to speak evil of him, to try to discredit him and his message in some way. And again, think of the Apostle Paul before he was confronted by Jesus. Within the context of the argument at this point, this would refer to the rejection of the truth of the good news of Jesus. But if someone uh, later on considered and further um, repented, then they would be forgiven, as Paul was. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit would be the rejection of the same truth in the full awareness that that is what is happening. So it is the thoughtful and willful rejection of the work of the Spirit of God, even though there can be no other explanation for the healings of Jesus. Blasphemy against the Spirit then means the complete and willful rejection of Jesus as the Messiah and the crediting of his works to Satan. So this is not a sin that a believer can commit. I want to say that again. I want you to hear this carefully. This is not a sin that a Christian can commit because a Christian, a true believer, has has already accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. Sometimes people worry that they may have committed the unforgivable sin, or they have in the past. But I want to say to you that if you are worried about it in the slightest, then there is no way that you have done it. Because if you have truly blasphemed the Holy Spirit, your heart would be so completely hardened against God that you wouldn't be worrying in the slightest whether God could forgive you or not. The Pharisees saw Jesus, the Son of God, doing good works by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they said, he does it by Satan's power. In so doing, they chose their side for all of eternity. As Jesus said, anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Importantly, this ties to our final point very well because really they had already chosen their side, hadn't they? The words they spoke only revealed the evil of their heart and that they were against Jesus from the outset. So point four, finally, Jesus talks about the importance of fruit in a person's life. 
especially as it relates to our speech, our words. Your words reveal your heart and you will have to give an account for every word you have spoken. Look at verses 33 to 35 where Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit will be good or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good person produces good things from his storeroom of good and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. How do you tell if a tree is bad or good? Well, you look at its fruit. You don't dig up the roots buried under the ground because you don't have to. You can just look at the fruit and taste it and it will tell you everything that you need to know. In the very same way, your words reveal your heart. How do you know what was in the Pharisees' hearts? Just listen to their words. They accused Jesus of being empowered by Satan and that tells you everything that you need to know. They weren't evil because of the words they spoke. Rather, the words they spoke revealed the evil that was already in their hearts. How strong are these words of Jesus? Brood of vipers, sons of serpents. How can you speak good things when you are evil? Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or as an old proverb puts it, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. If you have good things stored in your heart, then good things are going to come out of your mouth. If bad things are coming out of your mouth, that means you have bad things stored in your heart. Your words reveal your heart. Look at verses 36 and 37. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Have you ever spoken a careless word? Have you ever said something you wish you could take back? Of course you have. We all have. But there are no excuses on Judgment Day. We will all have to give an account for all the words we have spoken. And if even a careless word will be brought forward for judgment, how much more the deliberate, wrongful, hurtful words that we have spoken. Jesus said, by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. The good, the bad and the ugly will all be brought forth on Judgment Day. The Pharisees accused Jesus of being empowered by Satan. Those words would return to them, or will return to them on the day of judgment. And all your words and all mine will be brought forth for judgment as well. Now, please don't hear me say that words spoken will get you in or keep you out of heaven. No, we are saved by grace alone. But don't misunderstand how seriously our Father takes what we say. James in chapter 1 verse 26 says, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. James also says that faith without works is dead. And I want to say that grace without a changed attitude, speech and action has no life either. We have not understood grace correctly if we think that our words don't matter because we are saved. Thank God for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. As I said earlier, the ultimate conflict behind all other conflicts is the conflict between Jesus and Satan. Jesus and Satan are not on the same side and it is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit to suggest otherwise. The message of this passage is not so much whose side are you on, or who will you choose, but what do your words say about which side you are already on? There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. We all sin. We all get it wrong at times. But if your words, how you use them, and often the actions that go along with them, are consistently revealing that the state of your heart is, well, ugly, evil, well, it's time to repent. If you feel that you are on the wrong side of history in this or just failing miserably like all Christians do, we'll be reassured. 
I want to repeat something that I said earlier. Be reassured because the good news is that all kinds of sins and blasphemies can be forgiven. It means that no matter how badly you have sinned against God, God can still forgive you. In fact, the Bible says that even blasphemy against Jesus can be forgiven. That's really good news. But remember also that if you continually deny the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who reveals Jesus to you and convicts you of the need to repent, if you continue to do that, then your heart will become so hardened that alongside the Pharisees there will be no forgiveness in this life or the next. Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, in a moment we will all get a a chance to say confession together, but um, before we do, Father, I just, um, yeah, I want to bring before you uh, all our hearts. Uh, You know what is in them um, even before we do. Father, forgive us for the words that we have spoken which have been wrong, uh, have been hurtful, or whatever they have been that haven't been giving praise and glory to you in them in the way that we have spoken them and the things that we have said. Heavenly Father, don't let us forget this uh, this passage, uh, these strong words that you would have us take deep into our hearts, that you would change us more and more to be like your son. Amen.